Okay, so this is Math 372, Complex Analysis, Lecture 16. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do more stuff with conformal maps. So the chapter, Chapter 8, starts by saying that there are slightly different definitions depending on where you look as to what a conformal map is, which is what you always love to see at the beginning of a chapter, that the notation is not standardized. Okay. Anybody, can anybody tell me what the chapter defines conformal map to be? Bijective holomorphic. And so this implies that the inverse exists. And then as a theorem, the inverse is also holomorphic. So one of the dangers is you might not have a good inverse. So us, so conformal, you know, f from u to v, f is 1 to 1, on to holomorphic. Okay, so the first question is, what can we say about the inverse? So if we imagine, you know, here's u, and here's v, here's f, here's g. So what I want to do is I want to try to motivate one of the theorems we're going to prove. What relationship do we have between f and g? They're inverses. So f of g of z is z, and g of f of z is z. So we can rewrite this as you know, f prime of g of z, g prime of z equals 1. That's the chain rule. So g prime of z is 1 over f prime of g of z. So you might have seen this before when we were trying to find, say, derivatives of inverse trig functions. You know, like octangent, how we got the derivative of that. I can't remember if we did that in this class. But do you use this rule? Do we do octangent? All right, let, let's just do octangent. It, it's really worth seeing how powerful this relation is. Or, well, no, this is complex analysis. I shouldn't do octangent. I'll do, I'll do exponential and log. What's the exponential of the natural log of x? x. I raise e by the number of powers of e I need to get x. So according to the chain rule, I get the derivative of the exponential function at the natural log of x times the derivative of the natural log of x equals 1. So the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over the exponential at the natural log of x prime. All right, what's the derivative of the exponential function? The exponential function, e to the x. And so I get the derivative of the natural log is just 1 over x. So this gives you a sense of the power of you know, having inverse functions, of having this relationship. If you know one derivative, you know the other derivative. And this is how we build up from knowing the derivative of e to the x is e to the x to knowing the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Conversely, if you build up your theory on the natural logarithm, you could then get the derivative of the exponential function. Why is this useful? Well, let's go over here now, and let's assume we have a holomorphic function f and it's inverse g. What can you tell me must be true about f? You know, if we want g to be a nice holomorphic function, what should be true about f? Yeah, it, it's, its derivative can't be zero. So this is a result in the book. So this, you know, we want f prime to not be zero anywhere on u, else g is not holomorphic there. And given that the numerator is one, there's no chance of cancellation at all. So this suggests the result that we're going to prove. You know, the, I think the book has a result that if you are a bijection and you're holomorphic, then you can't have your derivative vanish anywhere in the set. I wanted to try to motivate why we would be proving a result like that. Why would we think a result like that might hold? Well, here's the reason. 
does this imply that f is differential that our g is differentiable that g is holomorphic or do we have to go through a little bit more analysis Yes, yeah, so I'm saying just by using this result over here, is this enough to get that G is holomorphic? That you know, here's here's what G prime is. So the book does a couple of lines by looking at you know, let's calculate the derivative of G and it goes through. Can we just get it immediately from this? We know F prime is holomorphic, but now we're evaluating it at some function G. I don't know. I, I, I want to say yes. I, I will admit I'm not entirely sure myself. It looks like, you know, he, here's what G prime is. But what if G is a discontinuous function? Then I could have F prime at a discontinuous function. This may not be varying holomorphically. It definitely gives me that G prime exists. And then the question is, is existence enough to mean that it's holomorphic? I feel more comfortable going through the book's argument where it actually explicitly calculates by taking a limit. Uh, to me, this is very close to a proof. I'm not 100% convinced because I worry, well, what if g is some kind of strange function? Then this limit could exist. But for holomorphic, maybe all we need is that the limit exists. All right, so here's the claim. Holomorphic F bijective, then F prime is not zero. Okay, so proof assume F prime is zero somewhere. Without loss of generality, f prime at what point is zero? The origin. What's the value of f at the origin without loss of generality? Zero. Why can we just assume that the value of the function is zero? Yeah, we can just subtract. If it was you know, 1701, just subtract 1701 from f, and that's not going to change any of the derivatives. So without loss of generality, we know the following. So now we know that f of z is equal to you know, a n, well, I think the book uses k, a k, z to the k, plus dot dot dot, where k is greater than or equal to 2. So we need to get a contradiction. Uh, because we know f prime of 0, 0. So we know f of 0, 0, so a 0, 0, a 1 is 0. So the first one has to be at least 2. And we want to get a contradiction from this. So the simplest case would be the simplest function that would satisfy this condition. z squared. So imagine. You know, f of z equals, I'll do maybe, you know, a2 z squared. Is that going to be injective in a small neighborhood of the origin? No, right? If two points differ by, you know, rotating by 180 degrees, when you square them, they'll be mapped to the same thing. So in this case, you know, clearly it's not one to one. What if we had f of z equals, you know, a k z to the k? That's also not one to one. You know, look at the point, you know, epsilon, and then epsilon e to the two pi i over k. Those points are both extremely close to the origin. 
and they'll both be mapped to the same thing. So again, we have a little bit of uh, time to really think about these problems and build some intuition. You can read all the stuff in the book, but the book is going to go through things a little bit faster. And so I want to spend some time and try to motivate why we argue the way we argue. So let's look at simpler cases. When we have something like this, well, if we can't even handle the case of, you know, basically z squared, you know, good luck in handling the general case. Now, there are times in life when looking at a, spe a specific case is bad because you then start trying to use special things about that and you don't see the general proof. But as a rule of thumb, try doing a simple case first and building up intuition. So the contradiction has to be coming, it seems to be coming from the fact that f is no longer injective. The bijective is talking about what values are hit. The injective is talking about two different things going to the same place. So the question is, would we be able to get um, a contradiction from injectivity if we have something like this? So there are you know, a couple of ways to approach this. What theorem might be useful? Fundamental theorem of algebra. OK. But we're, we're going to have an infinite polynomial in a moment. Oh. Okay. So if it was a finite polynomial, you, we'd be fine. But then, of course, with the fundamental theorem of algebra, we'd have to make sure that they were two distinct roots. So the fundamental theorem of algebra could give us a root with multiplicity. We want to show that there are two different points that go to the same thing. So Rouchet is probably useful. There's probably another fact that we might want to use at some point in our argument. Yeah, so do you think we need to use the fact that it's surjective? If not, the result is true in much greater generality. Right? I'm telling you, we have a holomorphic f that's bijective, and so far we've been focusing on the fact that it's holomorphic, we've been focusing on the fact that it's injective. We haven't really been worrying about surjective. Do you think we need the fact that it's surjective? So again, it could be that the result is true in greater generality, but we only care about using it in this case. And so the book has only focused on this case. Maybe the proof is easier in this case. I once got asked to referee a paper because the author used a theorem of mine. And I had to laugh because it wasn't my theorem. It was actually the author's theorem. And I had referred to the author. It was from the author's PhD thesis. But the author only was looking at the main term, so he didn't calculate the lower order term. I needed the lower order term, so I took his thesis, and I just did the calculations a little bit further. And I gave him full credit in my paper. So the journal then asks me to referee the paper because they see that the author is referring to my work. And I have to inform the journal, I'm happy to referee the paper, but I just want to let you know, in the interest of full disclosure, it's this author's theorem. And I've clearly said in my paper, it's this author's theorem. He could have proved a stronger result, but it would have cluttered up what he was doing. It wasn't necessary. It would have made my life a little bit easier a few years later. This is a real issue you have when you're writing papers. What is the level of generality you choose in writing a result? Frequently, you make a decision to go for an easier exposition, a clearer exposition. And sometimes you have a few brief comments. You know, if one wanted to, one could extend. So, Rouché, probably useful. Probably, probable, probably subjective is important. Right? So the goal is to try to figure out how we get to these proofs. So we're trying to show maybe as a contradiction, so aiming for two points sent to same point. I will buy surjectivity if we have a target point, we've got to have things that are sent to it. So if you think about what's going on, you know, here's zero, here's u. Here's our function f, and it maps 0 to 0. Right? 
right? And so if we take any point close to f of 0, there's got to be something here that's mapped to it. And we map open sets to open sets. So if I take a small open set of 0, I have to map to an open set over here that contains 0. So by open mapping, a small neighborhood of 0 is mapped to an open set containing 0. OK? So we're trying to set ourselves up for Rouché. So we're going to want to have you know, two functions. Uh, we'll have to write it as like a big F plus a big G. And we want to have uh, the G strictly less than F in absolute value. So if we look at F of Z, we can write F of Z as AK, ZK plus some error term. I think the book calls it G of Z. What can you say about G of Z relative to AK, ZK? <coughs> Wait, say it again. A big enough neighborhood? A small enough neighborhood, right. If you choose a small enough neighborhood about the origin, G of Z is going to be at least Z to the K plus 1. And so since it converges, it's going to be smaller. So we know that if we are really close to the origin, then a k z to the k is going to dominate g of z. So we want to find multiple solutions. So what we now do is I think we now pick a point And we want to choose something that would have multiple solutions. So we could look at, you know, maybe fix a small w near 0. We could look at, I think, a k z to the k minus w plus g of z. If we choose w sufficiently small, this will still be greater than g of z. If, so we have a bunch of different things going on at the same time. Why would I like this? Well, this is a very easy polynomial to count the roots of. And now we can use the fundamental theorem of algebra. It's a little bit of overkill when we have you know, a pure kth power polynomial. But you know, we've got the result. This, how many roots would this have? This would have k roots. And so then we would be getting k roots to the following. So this could be our big f of z. This can be g of z. And I'll put maybe a subscript w here to remind ourselves that this is depending on this point w. So if w is real small relative to the absolute value of z, which is small, then the absolute value of f of z is f w of z will be strictly greater than the absolute value of g of z when the absolute value of z equals epsilon. Okay? So we choose w really, really small relative to z, so small that this is still going to beat that, which we can do because this has a higher power of z. Once this is winning, this wins by a certain amount. Let's say it wins by 1 over a billion. Choose the absolute value of w to be 1 over a billion squared. And it won't be enough to affect things. So now by Rouché, we know that um, fw of z equals 0. And our original function, which is just now um, f of z minus w, have k roots in that small neighborhood. Because what is our new function? 
this is just going to be f of z minus w. If k is greater than 2, this looks like this would be a problem. So what's the only thing we now need to show? <coughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, so what would it mean if we had two of the k's that were the same? Well, I mean, what if two of the roots were the same? So we're not done. Right? We've just shown that f of z minus w has k roots. This is great. This seems to violate injectivity. The only problem is, what if the reason it has k roots is because one point is sent to w k times? It has a multiplicity k. So this is the small technical part of the proof. So I have deliberately not looked at my notes today so that I'm doing this live. I believe I have an idea as to how to get around this. But I want to try to give you a sense of how you approach problems like this. You know, the idea is look at a simple case. Build intuition. Keep reminding yourself as to what are you assuming. It's probably important if it's in the assumptions. So we're now down to the probability, to the problem of what if there are multiple roots? Um, what, if, what, if the same point is sent to, what if the same point is sent multiple times? So can I erase this? Do we all agree that this is the issue now? OK. So the only issue is if multiple roots. OK? If there are multiple roots, what can you tell me about the derivative at that point. It's zero, right? So say zw goes to under f goes to w with multiplicity at least two. Then we would know that the Taylor series would have to look like, you know, f at z would have to be something like at least you know a2 z minus zw squared and this could be zero but because it's at least a double root we know uh, maybe I should do sorry f of z minus w because it's a double root if I put in zw it's got to go into z minus zw squared has to come into this side. All right, so what we get is we get f prime of zw has to equal 0. Any thoughts as to how we can get a contradiction from this? It's one of my favorite results. You could use the accumulation. So what we can do is we can have a sequence of w's. So form a sequence of w's. w1, w2, dot, 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 dot. And each one is going to be smaller in absolute value. So w um, n will go to 0 in absolute value. And we know f prime of z w n equals 0. So the only w way we're in trouble is if every single time we play Rouché, we end up having a multiple 0. If there's even one time we play Rouché and we don't have a multiple 0, we're done. So let's assume the bad case happens infinitely often. So every time we Rouché it, it's another verb, we get another multiple 0. Well, then that means the derivative must be at that multiple 0. And we keep taking small and small. Now, is it possible that we could be getting the same ZWs? Could like ZW1 be the same as ZW2? No, because we're assuming uh, the absolute value of you know, WN is greater than the absolute value of WN plus 1. 
you know, our points are getting smaller. So ZW1 can't be sent to the same thing as ZW2. They're sent to things of different absolute value. So the sequence of ZWN is distinct, and it converges to So what will the z's converge to? It will converge to 0. Technically, it's just enough that it converges to something. right? We don't need to know that it converges to 0. It has to converge to 0. Now what can we conclude? Yep, yeah, sure. So you know that the absolute value is going to be We're choosing it. We're choosing a sequence of points. We're assuming that every time we apply Rouché, okay. we get a multiple root. Okay. I, did you say something about both the image and, or oh, all the images of W? Okay. So, okay. So what I'm saying is, you know, imagine we have these different bands, and we're going to choose W1 somewhere in here, W2 somewhere in here, W3 somewhere in here. So we have a sequence of Ws getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And every time we choose one of these, we're able to find two, I'm sorry, we're able to find a z that's mapped to it with multiplicity at least two. And again, we have a lot of games going on because in order to use Rouché stem, I've got to make sure my f is larger than my g. So once I know my z and I w, I might then have to shrink my z to make sure that this extra piece is smaller. I can do that. So the, I don't know how much smaller W2 is than W1. I don't know how small the epsilon balls are shrinking around the origin. But I know I can keep doing this. And you give me uh, a Z, I can eventually choose a sufficiently small W such that everything will be fine. I can play the Rouché game, and then I'll get another Z. I can't have two Zs going to the same W because the Ws have different absolute values. So I have a distinct sequence of Zs. If I had the same z every single time, and I try to use an accumulation argument, well, I know that f of 0, I'm sorry, f of z is always 0 whenever z is 0. Therefore, by the accumulation theorem, because the sequence of all zeros accumulates on 0, the function must be identically 0. This would be a false proof that all functions are identically 0. Right? It's not enough to know that, it, that the sequence accumulates. It has to be a sequence of distinct terms that accumulates. Most of the time, it's not hard to show that the terms are distinct, but you have to do it. So since they're distinct terms and they converge to zero, the sequence accumulates. Thus, f prime of z is identically zero. So what does it mean if f prime of z is identically zero? f is constant. You can either you know, talk about you know, finding the primitive to this, or if you want, if you want to calculate the second derivative, that would be the limit as h goes to 0 of f prime of z plus h minus f prime of z over h, which is just 0. Right? Because if the first derivative is 0, just calculate the second derivative by the limit. OK. So, once we know that f prime is identically zero, that implies f prime, I'm sorry, that implies f of z is constant. And first, what's the only possible constant? Zero. zero. Is this a contradiction? Yes, you know, we're assuming f is one to one and on to from an open set to an open set. This function is clearly not one to one. It maps everything to the origin. It's clearly not onto. It maps everything onto a point. Right? Massive contradiction. Not one to one, not onto. But it is at least holomorphic, okay? So we didn't contradict every single property of the function. You know, at least we preserved holomorphicity. Okay? So this is the proof that if your function is a holomorphic bijection, then its first derivative can never vanish. 
is this different than real analysis? It's been a long time since we've played real versus complex. You know, it's not one of the more popular party games. So I'm, for people who want, I am trying to lecture slightly differently than I did in 2015. So if you want, you're also welcome to look at the 2015 lectures, and there'll be a slightly different perspective on the material. Um, so I'm trying to give you, in some sense, two different lectures for the price of one. So real versus complex. Who do you think wins? Complex. complex. I mean, really. I mean, this is... This is like when I go to my uh, kid's school to do math. They know now not to uh, play math games against me. They know if I'm introducing the game, I will win the game. And unfortunately, my kids can't do this with my wife anymore. She goes, wait, did you get this game from daddy? Yes. No, I'm not playing. So in complex, so let, let, let's assume you know, we, have, we have F, we have G. Here, we have f prime is not 0 if f is holomorphic. What if f is differentiable? Now, this is the complex case. The real case, I would have to have maybe some interval mapped to some interval. Okay, what's x plus sine? Of, there's an easier function than x plus sine of x that oh, might work. This is x cubed, right? So if we look at the function f of x is x cubed. So I'm, I'm not saying your function is wrong, but I'm saying since I'm the one at the blackboard with the chalk, I would much rather work with x cubed. <coughs> so here's minus 1, here's 1. Here's 1, here's minus 1. Is the function f of x equal x cubed? Is this a bijection from minus 1, 1 to minus 1, 1? Yes. Is the derivative ever 0? Yes. f prime of x is 3x squared. f prime of 0 equals 0. In fact, not only is the first derivative 0, the second derivative is 0. What would go on if we looked at this on the complex analysis side? Could this be a bijection from the disk to the disk? No. It could be a bijection maybe from a sector to a larger sector. That we could do. But the problem is we have the possibility of going through angles. What's nice on the real li line is when we cube things, we don't change sign. And so we can keep the function negative and positive here. So there's lots of functions you could play with. Um, so it's just good to see how different the real and the complex cases are. In the real case, I can have a bijection. And this is a really nice function. This is an infinitely differentiable function. And its first derivative vanishes. What does that mean about the inverse? Yeah, so let, let's actually calculate the inverse. So if we have x cubed equals y, so this is, you know, f of x is x cubed. We want to find the function g of y. What should the inverse function be? The cube root. So we should have uh, y to the one third would be x. So g of y is y to the one third. Is this function defined for all y? What, what y is it not defined? For all real values of y. If it was complex, then there would be issues. What do we mean by the third root? There are multiple third roots. You know, e to the 2 pi i um, how do 
Oh, let's raise this. over 3 and e to the 4 pi i over 3. So these different numbers. They're different numbers, but do they have the same cube? So now, when I look at this function g of y, for what values of y is this defined? For what real values of y is this defined? It's defined for the whole real line. If y is positive, no problem. If y is 0, it's 0. If y is negative, well, the cube root of a negative number can still be a negative number. Now, there's, two al there's also two other complex roots, but this is defined for all y. Defined for all real y. g prime of y is 1 third y to the negative 2 thirds. Ah! And now we can see the issue. Okay? G prime of zero is undefined. So unfortunately, as you go deeper in mathematics, the books can become often more and more terse. It's good now and then to just stop, elaborate, and really look at what's going on and look at the differences. Always compare this to your real case and just see this is a strange subject. Okay. I will mention upon which uh, somebody asked me when they were preparing for the exam, and I've shared with at least one other person in the class. Um, just to, we're, we're right now on a little bit of a run of how strange complex is from real. So the problem is you have the unit circle, and you choose some number of points any way you want on the unit circle. And the claim is there is always at least one special point on the boundary of the unit circle, such that if you look at the product of the distances from that point to all the other points, you get 1. So the proof is as follows. If you have a point on the boundary where the product of the distances is greater than 1, just move it towards one of the zero, one of the special points, and then the product will go towards zero, so you can move the product down to one. So all you have to do is show that there is at least one point on the boundary where the product of the distances is at least one in absolute value. The way we do this, I only know how to do this with complex analysis. We can define for any point in the unit disk, f of z to be the product of the distances from that point to all the points on the boundary. What is the only point that is easy to evaluate? One of the points? No, well, okay, okay. So, sorry. There are, the, there are those points because the product will be zero. There's one other point other than those points where it's easy. You can choose any point inside the unit disk. What point can you choose where you can evaluate the product of the distances from that point to all the points on the boundary? Zero. zero. What does f of zero have to equal? One. By the maximum modulus principle, the absolute value cannot attain a maximum in the interior unless the function is constant. This function is not constant. Therefore, it must attain its maximum somewhere on the boundary. Done. I will give extra credit to anybody who can give me a non-complex analytic proof of this. This is your tactical strike again. Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is absolutely incredible. I don't see how to do this without using complex analysis. It's a wonderful result. But no matter how you position the points, you can always find one point whose product of the distances. So, and then you can probably come up with other generalizations if you want to do sums and various things. But So complex analysis is just fundamentally different than real analysis. And the more times we see this, I think the better we will be, and the more we can appreciate what you can get from these theorems. So these theorems are strange. Um, we are a little bit ahead because we had spent some time doing something else. So we've already done a lot of those maps. What I want to do very briefly right now 
is just mention one other possibility. <coughs> we had looked at, say, maybe we had, you know, f of z was, you know, a k z to the k plus, you know, maybe a k plus 1 z k plus 1 plus dot, 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 dot. I want to just start another proof and leave this as something for you to ponder. I could write this as, you know, a k z to the k 1 plus a k plus 1 over a k z plus dot, dot, dot. So I could write this as a, I'll write this as this, alpha z to the k 1 plus h of z, where h is some nice function. What I'd love to be able to do is say, because this function h of z is really close to 0, I can write this as alpha of z to the k g of z to the k, where g of z is 1 plus h of z to the 1 over k. And then if I have that, you know, could I then somehow write this maybe as, you know, alpha z g of z to the k, and somehow try to use this to get a contradiction. So I don't know if you can make this work, but I'm just putting these out there as for other things for you to try. We used Rouchet's theorem, which is a great result. But it's nice to think, what other things can we do? Can we somehow change variables and make it into a nicer function like this and get a contradiction with injectivity? All right, so the last part for today is to really start looking at special maps. And so the first one that I want to do, and probably the only one we'll have time to do today, And then the book goes through a lot of them. You know, best thing to do is to just look at the book slowly, go through the examples. Is let's take the map f of z is uh, i minus z over. I think I have one plus z, but I'm pretty sure that's an i plus z. And then g of z is equal to i one minus w over 1 plus w. Did you mean GFW? I'm sorry? GFW. Oh, GFW, yes. And then I, th I think that's supposed to be an i plus z and not a 1 plus z. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, I was about to say, I, th I think my notes are wrong, because I, I can't imagine that it would be 1. So the question is, what do these map things to? So probably mapping to the disk or from the disk. And so if you look at this function over here, it sends i to the disk. So this is going to map the upper half plane, I believe, Let's see the, um, to the unit disk. And here's 0, and here's i. So the question is, how do you see that it's mapping to the unit disk? Well, one thing we could do is we could see what happens if we take z to be real. You know, what does it do to the boundary of the upper half plane? So if z is an r, then basically we have f of x, which is i minus x over i plus x. What's the absolute value? Absolute value is 1. So it's mapping the boundary of the upper half plane to the boundary of the unit disk. Why is the absolute value 1? Because these are essentially complex conjugates of each other. I can pull out a negative sign up top and write this uh, as x minus i, if you want. So it's negative x minus i over x plus i. So because they're complex conjugates, they'll just be 1. Now the question is, do we get every point on the boundary of the unit disk. So you like if we miss any points, it would be I. OK, so we could try and see, you know, could we solve this and get this to equal I? So if we had i minus x over i plus x, 
equals i, you would have i minus x equals i times i is minus 1 plus ix. And so then we would get um, i plus 1, we bring this over, is i plus 1x. So I think if we take x equals 1, So of course, we could try this for other points. Instead of i, we could try b e to the i theta. And if we do that, we would have i minus x equals e to the i theta plus e to the i theta x. And now this suggests, well, if this was negative 1, maybe we would have some trouble. Isn't there be an i in front of the first? Uh, yes, thank you. So we want to be able to solve for x. So maybe if e to the i theta is negative 1, we would have trouble. So if we take e to the i theta equals negative 1, then over here we would have negative 1, negative 1 is 1. Oh, so let's see, we've got e to the i theta, so i. Right, well, I was going to say good. So I was doing algebra. Thing. So if this is equal to negative 1, we have negative i equals i. So it yields negative i equals i false. So the point we can't get is the point negative 1. So with a little bit of work, you can show you get everything else. We don't get negative 1. And now you want to figure out, does it map everything inside? So can you show that the absolute value of anything is less than 1? And can you show that it's on to? So there's a lot of calculations. You know, we've done some stuff like this before. What do you think the second map is? The i 1 minus w over 1 plus w. Probably it's inverse. So how would we find the inverse? Well, one is we could say we want i minus z over i plus z to equal w. Now let's solve for given a z, find out what w we need. So we would then have i minus z equals w i plus wz. So we bring the z's on both sides. We get i minus iw equals wz plus z. So we get a w plus 1. We can pull out an i. We get 1 minus w over 1 plus w equals z. And so this is how you can find the inverses. This is very similar to how we got the inverse function you know, g of y was y to the 1 third. There's one other way we could get the inverse very quickly. So we could note that for f, this corresponds to the matrix negative 1, i, 1, i. Right? If I apply another matrix G, a, b, c, d, and if c, d, and if it's a thing that, the identity is 0, 1, 0, 1. So another way we could figure out what the inverse of the function f is is say, well, look, I want some function. Let's assume it's also of the form of a fractional linear transform and see if I can find one. Now, we've got to be a little bit careful. Does it have to be 1, 1 over here? Yeah, it could be any fixed constant that's not 0. And this will probably be a good place to end because if I give you the matrix C0, 0, C, 
acting on z that goes to cz plus 0 over 0z plus c, which is just c. It doesn't, it doesn't, like, nope, it, it just sends z to z. If you think back to abstract algebra, which most people other than myself have taken, you know, all even numbers are equivalent modulo 2. So we look at matrices and we say they're equivalent modulo a multiple of the diagonal. So anything that's a multiple of the diagonal functions the same as just, I mean, it's a multiple of the identity. So basically, the identity and C identity, they have the same action. Okay, this is a good place to stop. Have a good one.